the anti anti missile missile. And that is why we need the assistance of the Office of Secret Projects. The anti anti missile missile. Yeah, boy, yeah, boy. See, this rocket will knock down their anti missile, thereby allowing our original missile to go through. The professor has called in secret projects to guard the plans to this new weapon, but there's a twist. The plans he just showed them are fake. He knows some spies are out to steal the specs to this rocket, so he wants secret projects to arrange for the fake ones to be stolen, while the real ones are kept nice and safely tucked away. Reed decides Stanley is the man for the job of getting the phony plans stolen. By the way, when did you first come to this country? Well, I was born here. I'm an American citizen. Uh, why do you ask? Well, your, your, your accent. Ah! Uh. <laughs> My accent. <laughs> <clears throat> Unless a rocket scientist speaks with a German accent, nobody will listen to him. Dig? I didn't understand that in 1967 because I didn't know who Werner von Braun was. Now all I can say is, ooh, burn. I'm showing the opening credits for this episode because I want to point out what's happening on the screen. Nothing. We have an establishing shot of the Washington Monument. Now, compare that to the typical credit sequence in Batman. See the difference? Even though it's the same thing every week, the same jog to the Batmobile, the same exit from the cave, the same roadside, even though it's all reusable footage, something is happening. We're watching people do something, not staring at a bad postcard photo. It's a small thing, but it goes to effort. The Batman people put that little extra effort to see that even the credit sequence was somewhat interesting, whereas these guys didn't bother. I suspect it's yet another reason why Batman succeeded and this didn't. Reed calls Stanley into his office. Gee, I wonder if that's going to come back to haunt him. Why are the real plans there anyway? There's no need for him to be out of the safe. Stanley takes the real case by mistake, of course, and outside headquarters he meets the lovely Tanya. Oh, I am sorry. Forgive, no, forgive me. It was my fault. I only exchange gifts with people I know. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Ah, it's a lovely case. I would like to have it. Why don't we go to my place and uh, talk it over? Hmm? Oh, well, uh, well, couldn't we go to a more public place? And how about uh, lunch? I'm starved. Ah, very well. We shall conclude negotiations at lunch. Taxi. While they head off to a restaurant, the mistake has been discovered. How could such a mistake happen? You knew the other briefcase contained the real plans. How could you let him take it? Well, it's not possible. When you're dealing with Stanley, anything is possible. Here's a crazy idea. Maybe double check the contents of the case before you send him out with it. Or have an identifying mark, a particular scuff pattern or something that identifies the real one. Some way to tell them apart. Maybe if you were a little less sloppy, this wouldn't happen. I'm taking this way too seriously again, aren't I? Stanley calls him from the restaurant and learns that he's not to let the case out of his sight. Reed and Trent will be right over. Another coincidence. I work for my country, too. Oh, is your, is your country friendly? No, but I am. <laughs> Reed and Trent arrive just as Stanley realizes the case is gone. Young lady, that briefcase, do you have any idea where it is? Search me? <clears throat> Excellent suggestion, however, business before pleasure. Reed got a good line for once. They don't even know the country she works for, so Stanley has to go poking around every embassy in the city trying to locate the briefcase. And why didn't they take Tanya into custody, since it's obvious now that she's a spy and was part of the plan to steal the case? Stanley's only been checking on the big countries that hate us, so Reed says it's time to look into some of the smaller ones. Well, then you might try the, the Translatvian Embassy. It's a... Oh, it's right over there. Did he say the Transvestian Embassy? Is that a nation of cross-dressers? 
you will return to Translatvia a national hero. If that's the second highest award, what's the first? You don't have to go back to Translatvia at all. Translatvia. Transvestia sounds way more interesting, but whatever. Stanley checks the place out and discovers the case. He discovers something else. Ah, Tanya, my darling. One of our country's greatest natural resources. <laughs> They send him back in with the fake plans and tell him to exchange the cases. Now, Boris has the real one handcuffed to his wrist, but Stanley's supposed to figure out how to get it anyway. He gives it his best shot. Right. I do not feel cold anymore. No, of course not. <laughs> Who are you? After some running around, Stanley dives out the window and runs away while frantically searching for the booster pill in his pocket. Maybe he should keep it in a ring like Underdog does. Stanley says, they're all in there unconscious, let's go arrest them. Reed says, we can't, they're on embassy soil, so technically we would be trespassing. Stanley has a solution to that. He could just go inside and carry the unconscious trio out to the street, but that wouldn't be funny. This was, I guess. I get the feeling we know we're being cancelled and we've given up. The plot is predictable from the very first frame. The only real characterization we see is when Trent gets uncharacteristically short-tempered with Stanley a couple of times. And we needed a phony country name so we came up with Translatvia, a not-so-subtle jab at the Balkan nation of Latvia, which was part of the Soviet Union at the time. I really thought Reed said Transvestia. Time to change the channel. Lloyd Larchmont, the noted owner of a chain of men's clubs and men's magazines and totally not Bob Newhart pretending to be Hugh Hefner, is opening a club in Big Town, but there's been a possible attempt on his life. So Mayor Uncle Fred, Chief Siegel, and Captain Nice are attending the festivities to provide extra protection. I can't think of anyone more deserving of my admiration. Oh, then you've heard of Captain Nice. Uh, who? <laughs> Captain Nice. Oh, I... I thought you were someone else. He knows someone else who dresses like that? The apple is the symbol of his empire, and every time he opens a new club, he unveils an apple and takes the first bite out of it. Something wrong. What are you talking about? Look at the top of that pedestal. It's turned a different color from the rest of it. So what? There's been some chemical reaction. As usual, it's going to take Carter half an hour to get to the point, and even then he never does get around to the word poison. Happily, for a change he realizes explaining is going to take too long, especially the way he does it, so he just acts. Look, can't we go into this later? Let me see that apple. Superhuman strength is no excuse for rudeness. Dude, it's an apple. There's no shortage. Let him have that one and get another one. Don't eat that. Excuse me. What is it? Concentrated sulfuric acid. One bite of that apple. And Mr. Larchmont, don't... Don't describe it. Don't describe it, I'll do that myself. I can just see the newspapers all over the country. America's swinging its most popular bachelor in his final agonizing, yet still devilishly attractive moments. I'll bet he has an obituary written for every occasion, too, just to be sure. That was a close call, Mr. Larchmont. I think you owe a debt of gratitude to Captain Knight. Uh -oh. That's an amazing bit of concise but thorough characterization right there. That one brief exchange tells us just about everything we need to know about Lloyd Larchmont. Specifically, he's at least as narcissistic as a certain orange clown who shall remain nameless, and he's way more concerned about image than he is about anything else. He's so wrapped up in himself that he can't remember Captain Nice's name for one minute, even though the good captain just saved him. That's a second attempt on his life. Time to start doing some detecting and find out who has it in for him. Carter starts fingerprinting the staff while the mayor and the chief meet the rest of Larchmont's inner circle. 
These are my two closest advisors. This young lady organized and trained all my Apple girls. She's been my faithful right arm for many years. Rusty... Last name. Davis. Correct, Rusty Davis. That's Joanne Worley. She was just getting started in television, and later that year she would join the cast of Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In and keep audiences rolling on the floor for the next six seasons. Sergeant Kane is going undercover as one of the Apple girls to try and gather information about who might be trying to kill Larchmont. Later in the evening, Carter is supposed to go to the club, contact her, and get her report. He says he'll take his parents along just to help blend in. At Larchmont's club, a major plot is unfolding. There's not a minute to lose. We failed in our other attempts. Now we have to kill them before they audit the books tomorrow and find out that we've been taking the money. That'll give me the time to fix them. That's fine with me. I won't be happy until he's gotten rid of. They want to kill him so he doesn't find out they've been embezzling. What a fresh, new, unique plot idea. Why hasn't somebody thought of this before? Writers all over the world should be kicking themselves for not thinking of this one. Candy gets into her new Apple Girl outfit and gets ready to start the new job. Uh, Rusty, this is Candy. Candy, this is Rusty... Uh... Davis. Right. Uh, I'd like you to put Candy to work uh, tonight behind the souvenir counter. Oh, well, we've already so many items for sale. I mean, as a saleswoman. Ouch! I didn't catch that when I was 14. Does their souvenir counter also sell... Um, isn't that illegal in most states? Um, have you had any experience? How do you mean? You'll do. Rusty takes large aside for a private conversation. Would you say that again? Please. All right. When you fall in love with... Slow down! Pardon? Thank you, Sergeant. She's going to have an interesting report for Carter this evening. Hi. Welcome to the Apple Club. I'm your Apple girl, Babsy. Arby, stop reading that girl. He was being polite. She pointed to it and everything. Can I take your order now? Uh, we'll start with some warm Andalusian hors d'oeuvres, then the puree of Mongol soup, and for the main course, I think we'll try the uh, Bolivian guinea hen, basted in yak butter. <laughs> then for dessert, the crepes flambe and Rhine wine sauce. Hey, Pierre! Three number seven! We have some good jokes in this episode. We also have Bob Newhart playing the major character, so you know you're going to get good lines delivered perfectly. Why didn't they do this from the start? Mother, I have to contact Sergeant Kane and find out if she discovered anything. Well, don't you think it's dangerous to contact Sergeant Kane? That waitress must know you work for the police department. Oh, you're right. Why not let me do it? That's a good idea. Because the waitress doesn't realize you're sitting at the same table making family conversation with the guy they know works for the police department, so she won't get suspicious of you. Oh, no. I think that Rusty, the girl who's in charge of all the Apple Girls, I think she's mixed up in the plot to kill Larchmont. Oh, Bill Carter. <laughs> That's Rusty. Oh. Or maybe she will. She takes them to Larchmont's office where Lionel is wiring something up to the tape player on the wall. What are you going to do? It's quite simple. After Lloyd gets back and I tie him up, then I'm going to put on a tape recording and leave the room. The tape recording will activate a bomb. This whole apartment will be blown sky high. Larchmont comes in and they tie him up in his office chair. We've rigged the tape recorder, Lloyd. And if anyone turns it off, it will explode automatically. You'll be hearing my voice counting backwards from 20 to 1. At the word 1, the bomb will explode. Carter tracks his mother and Candy to the office and starts untying everyone. Quickly. All of you leave. Eight. I think I can handle this. Seven. Hey, I can use some help. <laughs> nice touch. When he realizes he can't defuse the bomb, he drinks the formula. One. Carter. What's happened to Carter? Oh, he'll be all right. Oh, look. Captain Nice, where's Carter? Oh, he's all right. I flew him up to the roof a few seconds before the explosion. Something you may have noticed about this show by now, Captain Nice himself doesn't appear that much. Most of the screen time is given to story development and character development. When you get right down to it, the less Captain Nice is on the screen, the better the episode is. 
Lately, they've been saving him for those crucial moments when the cavalry comes charging in to save the wagon train. Carter only becomes Captain Nice when we need a hero to resolve a crisis. As I've said before, I would love to see a remake of this done right. Because as it stands, we're moving in a great direction with the story building and all the rest, but we only have one episode left. I would really like to see somebody pick up that style where it left off and see where it can take us. I doubt it'll ever happen, but hey, I can dream. Until next time.